One of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain. And Mark Twain said, it's much easier to fool people than it is to convince people that they've been fooled. Well, today we're going to talk about some very interesting lessons about COVID-19 and dare to ask the question, on a number of issues, have we been fooled? And with us to help discern this truth is one of my heroes, Dr. Martin Koldorf. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Okay, so a warm welcome you, to you, uh, Dr. Martin Koldorf. Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining this conversation today. Uh, thank you. Well, Martin, uh, you have a long history uh, as a, a biostatistician. You're uh, certainly one of the world's leading authorities around uh, vaccines and their efficacy and, and certainly on pandemics. And uh, you're also a professor at the uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, so we're, we're really grateful that you could join us. And, and I know one of the things that I, I still uh, celebrate is your leadership along with uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford and of course, uh, Dr. Sunita Gupta at Oxford. As you came together, it's hard to believe on October 4th, 2020, and you wrote and declared the so-called uh, Great Barrington Declaration, which was really, uh, I think, was a landmark document that called for, is it fair to say, best practices when it came to medicine regarding the COVID-19 uh, challenge. Can, can you explain to people what that declaration was about? Yeah, it called for following the basic principles of public health. And one of those basic principles is that you cannot only be concerned about one disease, you're concerned about uh, health as a whole, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of cancer, cardiovascular, mental health, and uh, not just today, but also for the future, and not just in a small group of people, but for the population at whole. So that's different from mm -hmm. uh, a medical doctor. If you go to your medical doctor, he or she is concerned about the one particular disease that you have at the moment, and you. Uh, mm -hmm. But public health is much broader than that. So uh, the emphasis on COVID, uh, where we used ineffective measures like lockdown, uh, that had enormous collateral public health damage, because people didn't mm -hmm. get their uh, uh, cancer screening or treatment, or their treatment for cardiovascular disease, mental health was deteriorating, diabetes, and so on. And of course, schools closing uh, here in the US have had uh, major impact, negative impact on children. Hmm. So well, the collateral damage I, I... from these lockdowns have been enormous. They really have been incredible. The the damage done by lockdowns and the and the response. Um, uh, looking back, and and certainly today we're going to have a far reaching conversations about those lessons learned. And so I think the Great Barrington Declaration is a very uh, landmark declaration regarding uh, best practices regarding uh, human health, as you say. Um, and I think part of the context then was. And it was fascinating because I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. During that time, the assertion by many authorities and governments across the Western world was that there was a consensus on the efficacy of these lockdowns. There was a consensus on so many things in retrospect that we realized weren't true. So I thought that the Great Barrington Declaration made a huge positive difference because you basically weighed in as, as a key leaders in your fields it was very hard to disagree with it. And and I believe you have well over a million signatures and you can see it online. So you really broke that message that wasn't really getting through that there's some kind of consensus. Is that is that right, Martin? Yeah, there's uh, uh, yes, shy of a million uh, signatures. But so many of us tried to speak up uh, from the very beginning in the spring of 2020. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't. I wasn't able to publish in the U.S. about this, arguing for uh, uh, focus protection, where you protect older people better 
while letting children and young people live their lives. Uh, I was able to publish in my native Sweden, but not in the U.S. And no, other wait a second. Had... You mean you 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 had this opinion that there was not a consensus, that there was important information from a professional medical point of view that you wanted to share, but you couldn't publish that, Martin. Why? Um, I sent it to various publications, uh, some more scientific and some more general, and they didn't want it. Okay. They don't want to hear this alternative message. And there were other people who tried to speak up. But most of our scientists who tried to speak up uh, had a very hard time doing it. So, uh, wow. uh, and, and if somebody said something, they would sort of say, oh, there's just one person or that person is not mm. uh, in the relevant field. So uh, with the Great Franklin Declaration, the fact that there were three of us made a difference. We were all had mm. worked in uh, infectious disease technology for a long time. So they couldn't claim that we were not in the field. And we were all from three reasonably respectable universities, uh, Harvard, mm. Stanford, and Oxford. So it became impossible for them then to ignore it. So they have pretended that there was a consensus, but there never was. And when I mm. talk personally to my colleagues, the majority agreed uh, with us uh, that we shouldn't lock down and that we should we should have so focus on uh, on uh, the vulnerable, those at high risk, which were the older people. Mm. But uh, mm -hmm. many were afraid of speaking up, also, and I understand why. Because uh, if you spoke up, there were consequences. Wow. So this is a very important lesson. And in, in retrospect, what you stated with uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya and, and Dr. Sunita Gupta were, were, were essentially true. And, and, and yet you were vilified. In fact, in retrospect, we found uh, all kinds of emails from people like um, the uh, you know, senior government officials consciously going after you guys, vilifying you, slandering you, in fact. It, it's really quite disturbing. Um, and, um, and, and, and so there's lessons to be learned from that, aren't there, uh, Martin? Yeah, and I think uh, one lesson is freedom of speech is a foundational pillar of civilization. And we have to mm. protect that uh, with everything we can. And secondly, Indeed. for science to operate, there needs to be a, a public, polite, but uh, polite debate. Uh, it can be, uh, it can be very passionate. That's good, but there has to mm -hmm. be a debate. So, uh, if there are different scientists with different perspectives, then that has to be discussed in open and not mm -hmm. do like the NIH director at the United States, the National Institute of Health, which is the biggest medical research agency, who uh, uh, the. Uh, who thought we were fringe epidemiologists and asked for a devastating takedown. He should instead have uh, sponsored the discussions and debates. That was his job, which he didn't do. Instead, he tried to squash anything that opposed what he thought was the correct thing, which, of course, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, bravo on you um, and and the group for for standing up for science and uh, open discussion and, and it wasn't wasn't certainly easy. Um, so if we look back to when COVID nineteen came on the scene, it seems like several years now. What was your initial reaction? You're a biostatistician, so you look at these stats very carefully. Were you concerned when when COVID nineteen came uh, on the horizon? Well, I was scared for about 10, 20 minutes. So right. first 10, of all, 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah. So first of all, when I heard that there was the outbreaks in Northern Italy and Iran, which were the two countries outside of China where it came first, mm -hmm. uh, it was clear to me, it was obvious that this will eventually reach the whole world. There was no way we could stop that from happening mm -hmm. because we didn't know how it came into Italy or Iran. So it was sort of spreading in a stealth underground fashion and when that's the case there's no way you can stop it just like we can't stop the influenza mm -hmm. that comes every year it's impossible so mm -hmm. uh, so that was clear so that was of course concerning because i knew it would eventually arrive to me and my family and friends and everybody else uh, so then i quickly looked at the data from wuhan and at that time we didn't know uh, what the fatality uh, rate was. But I look at the age distribution of those who had died in Wuhan, and then I found the uh, 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 
age distribution for the population in Wuhan, and I compare that. So I did a back of the envelope calculation, and I found that while obviously anybody can get a virus, and presumably everybody is exposed to approximately the same to amount, there was more than a thousandfold difference in the risk of dying from COVID, where the older people had more than a thousandfold higher risk than younger people. So this was clear that this was a disease that was dangerous for older people, but not for children. And like okay. most parents, I care more about my children. And I have three, uh, age 20. They were then uh, age 17, four and four. But uh, 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 as, as most parents, I care more about their lives than I care about mine. So it was obvious then that, okay, my kids were going to be fine. Other children were going to be mm-hmm. fine. We didn't have to worry about that. What we had to worry about is we'll have to try to put in something in place to protect older people because they are the ones who are at risk from this mm. virus. And then okay, so- once it has gone through society, then we have some form of herd immunity and then everybody can go back to living normal lives. Okay, so you you figured this out uh, fairly quickly, given your expertise and, and uh, experience in these matters. And you basically said that natural immunity will work its course through the the population but there is a particular profile of people that that this uh, covid-19 was a concern for they were risk at risk and that w- and you said that profile was older persons with like with with larger health concerns is that a fair comment uh, i would say that uh everybody in their 70s or 80s 90s and so on should be concerned but of course those who are mm-hmm. frail are at even higher risk okay so your kind of risk assessment that you did a number of years ago has that is that if those facts borne out is that if, if they withstand withstood scrutiny is is that still accurate yes we know now for sure that uh uh we know that it was more than a thousand fold difference in risk between age groups we know that children are minuscule uh, risk from uh, mm-hmm. Where we're minus risk from COVID and less risk from COVID than a, than an average influenza season, because every mm-hmm. year some kids die from influenza. Uh, also, mm-hmm. uh, the one country that implemented uh, a focus protection of not closing uh, all the schools and etc. and restaurants and, and businesses was Sweden. Uh, well, they, Sweden. Uh, so Sweden, it, it's clear that they did it right. Is that is that a fair comment? Yeah, so what matters is if people die or not. Uh, And you can look at all cause mortality, which is numbers that are very difficult to fudge. And if we compare the excess mortality, so you compare the mortality from 2020 and the next three or four years, and you compare that with what would have been expected based on previous years. And uh, Sweden has the lowest... Uh, excess mortality among Western countries. Sorry, Sweden has the lowest yes. all-cause mortality rate in the in in the Western countries, including yes. Canada. Yes. And, okay. Uh, uh, in terms of COVID mortality, Sweden is on the on the lower, but not the very lowest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you do all-cause mortality, so what happened is that the uh, Sweden has lower than average. Uh, COVID mortality, despite not locking down. So lockdown didn't do much for COVID. But uh, mm-hmm. then Sweden doesn't have this collateral damage on cancer and cardiovascular disease, etc., or, or wow. mental health conditions. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's proof that uh, Sweden was heavily criticized. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, newspapers yes. and politicians uh, were complaining and said that they were irresponsible and so on. And it mm-hmm. turns out that they knew what they were doing because they were following basic principles of public health. Indeed. Yeah. So I recall that well, uh, certainly in conversation with yourself and, and, and others, that Sweden was, was just utterly um, criticized left and right as being an outlier, as being somehow abnormal um extreme uh there were all kinds of words that that people uh, threw at them but they were right 
There's no doubt about that. Is that correct, yeah, uh, Martin? That's correct. And the data is in now. So, I mean, I knew that it was the right thing four years ago, but I understand that if you don't, if you don't know uh, epidemiology, then it's easy. And I don't think you should blame people for being fooled here because mm -hmm. you should blame the epidemiologists uh, who did not, uh, or are the leading scientists and mm -hmm. the politicians who didn't get this right. But you can't blame uh, regular people because they don't, they don't, I mean, if I was a chemist or a, or a plumber or a, uh, uh, or, 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 or a fireman or something, I wouldn't have known. Mm -hmm. Except, exactly. Uh, yeah. Except, actually, they did know quite well. So, uh, if mm -hmm. you take the truckers in Canada, for example, they knew, and they're smart. Uh, yeah. So, no, it, so, it is uh, truly remarkable. Regular people knew better this uh, than the than the heads of the universities and uh, the politicians mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. journalists. No, it, it's it's a stunning story in retrospect. So we need to remember history. We need to learn lessons from this. And, and so if we had to do this again, let's look to Sweden as that kind of example of uh, best practices of public health. Um, there were a lot of other assertions made, and, and I don't know where to begin. There were so many of them um, regarding mask wearing as an example. And, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to see people with masks now, and one never knows their, their particular situation, so one has to be compassionate. But it, 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 they used a lot of fear uh, to institute a lot of public health orders in retrospect that are, um, you know, shown in retrospect to be utterly wrong. So we, we talked about the, the whole efficacy of lockdowns as an example, but if you look at mask wearing or um, there's a whole host of other other things. Are there good examples that we can again learn from, Martin, in retrospect? Well, with masks, I mean, we should look at the high quality studies that were done uh, on mask efficacy. And there were two, the best studies are randomized trials, and there were two of them. Mm -hmm. And one was done in Denmark, showing if uh, mask wearing protected the, the person wearing the mask and found that it had no effect or minimal effect. There was no statistically significant effect of them. Mm -hmm. Then there was another study in Bangladesh where they, there was a very neat study because they randomized not individuals by villages, because that way they could could see if the mask not only protected the person wearing it, but also if it protected other people in the village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a good design, and they found that the infections were reduced somewhere between zero and 18%, which means mm -hmm. not at all or minuscule. Uh, so uh, we know that masks, uh, either they don't work or they work to a very limited extent. And mm, if, yeah. if, when that's the case, it's actually very dangerous to tell people to wear a mask and you'll be safe, or you put, the mask will protect you because then if you're 80 year old, you'll go out to that crowded restaurant and you think that the mask is protecting you and it's not. So uh, I okay. think people, wow. so this, this message of this false message of th making people think that they were protected by the mask actually, I think, killed people. Wow. Isn't that, uh, isn't that sad? So, I mean, I, I think the other point that I notice is beyond the message of fear that a lot of uh, public health authorities led with was the whole issue of why, why would we not encourage people to be healthy, to actually get outside, to exercise, to eat well. You didn't really hear that message or even be open in conversation with your physician about alternative remedies. We never heard that, did we, Martin? Yeah, that was the opposite because they closed the uh, beaches, they closed the uh, basketball courts, uh, they closed playgrounds for kids, which was completely ridiculous nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. know that uh, we know that uh, exercise and good food uh, helps with the immune system. Mm -hmm. So if we know that the <laughs> virus is going to come, uh, then we should uh, encourage people to be healthy and uh, eat mm -hmm. well and be out exercise. No, that's not going to. Uh, that's not like a. Uh, a exactly. But it's one thing that we always should do, and even more during the pandemic. 
So, mm -hmm. so well, to close this, uh, was... this close this ability to be outside, where there's a natural risk from getting the virus, and good opportunity for for uh, running or bicycling or canoeing or whatever is person's favorite thing mm -hmm. to do, that was uh, very very bad public health messaging. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think in retrospect, uh, I, I think what, what I found fascinating is the inherent contradiction around the approach to lockdowns is that you could go to Walmart, you could go to the liquor store, but you couldn't go to important points of socialization and community support, like going to a church or a synagogue or a, a temple or anything like that. So it, and then, and then to lock children away in, you know, away from schools really has put back children uh significantly in terms of their development in every way uh i hear this all the time from from teachers to this day that there's there's a whole uh generation of children that, that literally have been put back at least a year or two in their development it's very very sad yeah you can see from the u.s they have studies where the test scores are going down went down and they are now slowly trying to creep up again so and that's the mm. contrast to sweden where there's no such effect uh, no, it, so, it's really uh, that's, remarkable. Uh, and education, we know education is important for lifelong um, uh, uh, well-being, including uh, the being healthy. So, uh, and that was actually one of the arguments that uh, Anders Tegnell, who is the chief technologist that in Sweden used for not closing schools, that there are long-term negative health effects of closing schools. So that was one of the arguments he used. And of course, Indeed. so we know the test score are down, but I mean, it's also the mental health of children and, uh, and their uh, social skills, which are equally important. So if I could so change the another... thing with how I was done with the pandemic, it would have been to keep the schools open. If I, were, if, I were, if I could only change one thing, that's the one thing I would have picked. Interesting. So if one, one of the key mistakes was, was closing schools. Yep. Uh, well said. So I did want to talk with you as well. Uh, there's a famous quote uh, by a, a virologist who said, since the Athenian plague in 430 uh, BC, we have known about natural immunity. So it's strange that suddenly um, that this is under discussion. I think that was your quote, Martin Kaldorf. Can you tell us about natural immunity? I mean, that was remarkable because you had the uh, different authorities, including the director of the CDC, I remember this uh, distinctly, I think it was back in 2019, arguing that natural immunity was was really not the, the way to go. I mean, this is just stunning in retrospect, is it not, Martin? Yes, so we know, we have been, we have known since the uh, Athenian plague two and a half thousand years ago, that if you survive an infectious disease, then you have uh, immunity, natural immunity or, or, or infection acquired immunity that will protect you uh, the second time you get infected. For some diseases like uh, measles, that's lifelong protection. For other diseases like the coronaviruses, including those previous one and the current one, it's not uh, uh, a lifelong, you can get sick again, but the first time is when it's risky and, and the subsequent times uh, you sort of deal with it a little bit sick, like a cold, but you deal with it much better. So it doesn't have the same risk uh, the second and third and fourth time around and so on. So we have known about that. Uh, so, so the fact that people are starting to question this is quite amazing, including by uh, uh, very prominent scientists. So, uh, and when, for example, university professors, when they institute vaccine mandates for people who have already had the the disease, that's the mm. de facto uh, uh, rejection of um, uh, of immune system. And to mm. me, that's like uh, having a university president question whether the the earth is round or flat or whether yeah. gravity exists or not. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. same kind of a basic uh, scientific knowledge that we have known for so long and that was accepted until mm -hmm. uh, from 230 BC until 2019. And then from 2020 to 2020, 
for, for a few mm -hmm. years. Uh, and, and now I think people are recognized again. And the same thing, yeah, people no, were claiming, like CDC, and the CDC director was claiming that uh, you had better protection from the vaccine than from uh, infection acquired uh, immunity. Oh. And uh, they put out some very flawed study trying to prove that. But uh, mm -hmm. there were good studies, one from Israel, for example, that showed very mm -hmm. clearly that while the vaccine does, protect, that does give some uh, immune protection, it's, uh, it's not as good as those who have had COVID. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you should try to get it because. Uh, if you if you if you have a dangerous disease and it's dangerous for older people, you can die from it. Mm -hmm. So the purpose mm -hmm. of the vaccine is sort of to give you some of that protection without having to take the risk of getting the disease. Mm -hmm. So that's why vaccines are very good. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for example, measles or why it was very important for smallpox, mm -hmm. etc. But uh, but to sort of claim that vaccines are better than infectious acquired immunity. Uh, that it gives you better immunity than infection acquired immunity, that's very strange. And uh, I mean, basically, the vaccine is there to mimic what, what the body, mm -hmm. body does uh, uh, when it's infected. So it would be extremely surprising if the vaccine would ever be better than the immunity mm -hmm. you have from having acquired it. Exactly. And, and again, if, if you, if you, uh, if you, if you believe in these vaccines that they save lives, then mm -hmm. you should not vaccinate people who have already had it because you're wasting vaccines on those that don't need it at the same well time that there are people around the world that haven't had COVID and therefore they will get protection from the vaccine. So these vaccine exactly. mandates are not only uh, are, are, uh, are sort of unethical, uh, they are unscientific mm -hmm. and they are unethical because it forces people to take the vaccine that doesn't need it when there is a vaccine shortage. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if, if I hear what you're saying or understand what you're saying is that if you appreciate vaccines, you understand the efficacy of natural immunity. Yes, you should at least. I mean, this is basic medicine. So, yeah. Wow. So we, we, we threw out basic medicine and, and from the uh, Center for Disease Control, no less. So this is really raised a lot of questions and confidence about these institutions. And we'll get to that in a moment. But I did want to pick up the theme then about vaccines. So we know that these are a particular type of vaccines. And I'm asking you, Dr. Martin Kolderf, because you're one of the, the leading world authorities around uh, vaccines. Um, but are these really vaccines? Like it, it, it's very evident that these vaccines really didn't stop the transmission of this virus. So what the heck were they? And now we've also learned, at least in Canada, uh, Health Canada has admitted that they're adulterated. They have contaminants in them of, of DNA. So there's a lot of questions regarding what the heck are these, quote, vaccines, uh, Martin? Can you help us understand that? Uh, so it's true that they did not prevent uh, so everybody who who, who uh, got the vaccine would eventually get COVID also. Uh, <laughs> so that's true. Now, uh, when they were uh, when they were approved in uh, late 2020, December 2020, uh, the randomized trials that they that was run by Pfizer and Moderna, they did not evaluate the important outcome, which is death or hospitalization. What they showed Sorry. was. Wait a sec. Can you repeat that? They did not evaluate what? So, the purpose of the vaccine is to prevent death and also to some extent hospitalizations. But the, mm -hmm. the randomized trials did not evaluate whether they were able to do that. They evaluate whether they prevented symptomatic disease. And I don't want to be, uh, be harsh, but I don't actually care if you. Uh, are sick for a few days and have to stay home from work and be in bed for, for, for mm -hmm. a while. I care yeah. about you not dying and also not going to the hospital. That's good to avoid. Mm -hmm. So, right. but these, uh, these randomized trials, they evaluated only symptomatic uh, COVID disease. So they showed that mm -hmm. the, the mRNA vaccine had about a 95% efficacy in preventing symptomatic COVID disease 
for a few months, is short term. Uh, and then they stop the trial. So uh, now, so you have to then say, okay, we don't really care about symptomatic disease, but if they if they prevent symptomatic disease, probably they will also prevent death, at least in older people. And mm. they probably did that in 2021, is my guess, because we have observational data that show that, but we should have had randomized trials on that. Uh, now, the so so in uh, in uh, in the spring of 2021, I wrote I answered a question on Twitter, which I was censored for, at the behest of the U.S. government, directly who was directly sort of the line of, of communication there. Uh, I said that vaccines are important for older, high risk uh, people, but you don't need it if you've already had COVID uh, and children don't need it either. And I think that was a true so statement. You were then. asked by by leaders in the U.S. government for no, your was, opinion on this. No, it was asked by a random person on Twitter. So I. Oh, I see. Okay. I, and I, I answered that older people benefit from the vaccine. This was in 2021. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you don't need it, if you already have had COVID, because you have mm -hmm. infection acquired immunity, and children don't need it either. And I was censored by that at the behest of the U.S. government. Wow. Uh, uh, for saying that, no, which I think is something it's that's truly completely true. It's, it's completely true statement, what I said. And I think uh, it's very hard to argue against it on any scientific yeah. grounds. Okay, so so I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, but the vaccines had some efficacy for a particular vulnerable population, namely older people, health concerns, for short-term benefits. Is that... Is that a fair comment then? Uh, I would say so. So uh, I think in the 2021, it did have benefit for older people. Um, but we also know now that the efficacy of these vaccines wane very rapidly. The clinical trials mm -hmm. didn't evaluate that, but we know from observational data that uh, the efficacy of these vaccines wanes very, very fast. So, uh, okay. um, but, you know, clearly people have to talk with their physician, but if you've already had COVID-19, there really isn't in general any point to having the booster again. Is that is that a fair comment then? Well, that's the decision that I've taken, but I'm not a physician, mm -hmm. so I can't recommend, make any recommend for specific uh, people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the vaccines now because obviously one of the big issues now that is uh, people are very concerned about is the whole issue of vaccine injury. And I wanted to play this uh, short clip uh, of a story. They suffered life altering injuries after they got their COVID vaccine. Now two BC men are facing another battle, the fight for compensation. They were approved for the federal money, but they're still waiting to be reimbursed tens of thousands of dollars. CTV's Michelle Bernaro has more. Two and a half years after a COVID-19 Pfizer vaccine injury, Julian Schofield continues to rely on a wheelchair to get around. And while he's seen some improvement... I have um, pretty good mobility through my hips. Um, I can uh, crawl uh, around on the floor. There are new pains to endure. I've gone through lots of uh, nerve sensation and nerve pain. Um, and it's been elevating over time, getting worse and worse. Obviously, you can see they're kind of curled in and, and whatnot. Um, Ross Whiteman also faces ongoing physical yeah. struggles after developing a severe neurological disorder in April 2021 from the AstraZeneca vaccine. I have some, some tremors now, shaking. Both Whiteman and Schofield were approved for compensation through the Federal Vaccine Injury Support Program and have received payments, but both also say they are still owed tens of thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket medical expenses for things like the leg braces that allow Whiteman to walk. They're anywhere between $1,000 to $1,500 each. Or this elevator that Schofield had installed in his home so he could access the main living area. It's really challenging to be in this situation in the first part and then to have to fight tooth and nail to, to get what they say they're going to provide. 
uh, is completely demoralizing. But they say their emails and calls for reimbursement mostly go unanswered. It's the second case manager that I've had that has quit, and I was not notified that my case manager was no longer working there. CTV News contacted the company that oversees Ottawa's compensation program but did not hear back. As of last month, more than 2,230 people have submitted claims to Canada's vaccine injury support program. The majority of those have been deemed admissible. However, so far, just 138 have been approved. Meanwhile, both men say they need to focus their energy on adapting to their new life and healing instead of fighting for the help they were promised. Michelle Brunoro, CTV News, Vancouver. So these are uh, tragic stories of, of people injured by the vaccine. Uh, there's uh, actually a, a vaccine compensation program at the federal level for this. And um, we all know anecdotally uh, people that actually know who've been um, injured or claim to be injured by the vaccines. So this is uh, pretty controversial because the question then is, uh, Dr. Kraldorf, what what are you seeing statistically? Like these are examples of specific individuals, but is there a larger vaccine injury problem? I know that vaccines sometimes create injuries, but are you concerned that there's a lot of vaccine injuries in this country? So first of all, uh, I've been working on vaccine and drug safety for a few decades. So when there is a new drug or vaccine on the market, there are always risks involved with it. So when it comes to the COVID vaccine, if uh, for older people who are at high risk, there's actually benefit from these vaccines to reduce mm -hmm. deaths. And if that's the case, then you're willing to take a small risk from an adverse reaction. On the other hand, when you now go to middle-aged adults, young adults and children who has a very small risk from dying from COVID, then even if there's a small risk from adverse reaction from the vaccine, the balance of the benefit risk goes in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to give a, a drug or vaccine to people who has very minimal, where the potential benefit is very minimal because you don't know what the risks are. So it was mm -hmm. irresponsible to do a mass vaccination campaign for children and young adults because we can never know about exactly what the adverse reactions are from the randomized trials. Uh, so that's another reason why we should have focused the vaccines on those older people who are at high risk from COVID. Uh, so what do we know about the adverse reactions from the COVID vaccines? We know some things, for example, about myocarditis with inflammation of the heart. There has been many other reports, but as of yet, there hasn't been a full evaluation of the magnitude of the adverse reactions. That's possible to do. The data is, uh, will be available, and I'm sure it will be done uh, eventually. But so far, we don't have uh, great numbers on that. So we know there are some adverse reactions, but we don't know the full magnitude, magnitude of it. Okay. So there's there's a lot of angles to this, one of which is the, the mass vaccination approach didn't make sense because people outside those older age categories had extremely low risk with COVID-19. This is clear. So um, then meanwhile, you're incurring injuries on a younger population that didn't need to experience that. So that's, that's, is that what you're saying? Yeah, if, if the potential benefit, it doesn't matter if it's this vaccine or some other drug, if the potential mm -hmm. benefit is very, very small, then uh, you don't want to take the risk because there's always some risks. On the other yeah. hand, if you have cancer and there's a drug that can help uh, uh, with your cancer, then you, you can accept quite high mm -hmm. adverse react risk for adverse reactions. Um, and, and some of the cancer drugs have quite, uh, uh, have quite uh, high adverse reaction rates. But that's sort of an acceptable mm -hmm. thing then. So you have to benefit you have to you, you have to balance the the benefits with the potential risks and if the if the benefits are small which we know they were for for young people then you shouldn't uh, uh, then it's not worthwhile taking uh, the risk which we are, are still is still unknown 
Okay. So in general, it doesn't make sense, for instance, to vaccinate children because they're at, at you know, such uh, insignificant risk. Yeah, for example, Harvard University still has a mandate for students to be vaccinated. These are young people. I beg your pardon? The Harvard University still has a mandate mandating their students to be vaccinated. And uh, most of them are already have COVID, so they don't need it. But even if those who doesn't have it, they have such small risk from COVID that, uh, that does, those mandates doesn't make any sense at all. It's very unscientific and very unethical. Wow. Yeah. Is it, but the irony is that you work at Harvard University. They should be picking up the extension line and giving you a call and asking, does this make any sense? But obviously, they're not doing that. Uh, well, I don't work for Harvard anymore, so but uh, they're still welcome to call me if they want to, but they won't. So Okay. Well, okay. well th this is just stunning. I, I can't believe that um, there are these institutions again mandating that for for students of all things so this is is really tri truly remarkable so related to this story though is in canada we've had health canada recognize that there's there's dna within the vaccine so is this a problem is, is there anything that you can offer insight there so that's outside my area of expertise so mm -hmm. uh, i know about epidemiology and how to analyze studies, how to design studies, and look at the population uh, level and at clinical mm -hmm. levels for these studies, whether it's clinical trials, okay. observational studies. But okay. I don't know the the virology uh, or the microbiology of these things. So other people will have to respond to that. Okay, that that's great. So. Martin, one of the things that I found very interesting is you've done a lot of analysis about um, uh, different nations' response to COVID-19, including your home country of Sweden. And uh, you've stated eloquently how S Sweden essentially did it right. It wasn't perfect, but um, the, the results are in and, and it's very powerful. And so within this context, I, I guess what I'm getting at is the observation that sovereignty matters in the sense that Sweden had the power, the authority as a national government um, with their team of public health leaders to decide their particular approach to the pandemic. And that is in complete contrast with every other country, including this country, Canada. Uh, we have the national authority to be able to make those decisions. But something peculiar has been happening the last um, two years, um, and that has been the introduction of the World Health Organization mandates regarding so-called pandemic treaties. Or in other words, the whole idea that if we sign on uh, as a large international community, we can somehow manage these future pandemics as one body under one kind of uh, global regime, if you will. And and I, I don't actually know the status on, on Sweden signing on to this, but does this not concern you that all of a sudden we take this one approach mandated from kind of a World Health Organization bureaucracy that in retrospect was utterly a failure? Uh, I think it's a huge concern that uh, uh, that treaty and uh, it's important that different countries have the ability to to uh, uh, do their own thing for two reasons. One is that there are local differences, but the other reason is that uh, then you find out afterwards who did well and who did not. And we need to know that. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why so many politicians were attacking Sweden is that they were afraid because mm -hmm. they did the lockdowns and they were afraid that if Sweden didn't do them, and it turned out better, then they would look really bad. They would be embarrassed. And that's yeah, exactly what happened. Right. So Sweden became like the control group. So there's that's infutable evidence now that lockdowns did not make sense. But if Sweden had been forced to follow the rest uh, of the world or, or, or the European Union, then we wouldn't have had that example. Yeah. And I think actually so in, the U of... US, in the US, in the US is a strength because uh, each state has the, has responsibility for public health, so each state can do mm -hmm. what they want. They they most follow the CDC guidelines or recommendations, but not everybody. South Dakota did not, 
and Florida did not. So Florida closed down in the spring of 2020, yeah. but then they opened exactly. up because the governor realized that uh, that that wasn't the right approach. He started to read about public health. And uh, we can compare, for example, Florida and California. California was one of the ones who locked down the, the worst, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Florida came out better. So, um, but, but I think this is a stunning example, Martin, and it's a very important public policy. You want to devolve power to the locus, local, le, most local level possible so that people can make their decisions. So in this example, I think you, you, you stated well, Florida went a different way and the, uh, the results are like Sweden in complete positive contrast with so many other jurisdictions. And so if we just centralize power and authority, we lose the ability to innovate and be able to protect and serve the people. So that for me, I think is another lesson is that governance matters here, doesn't, doesn't it? I agree. We should have uh, uh, to have a centralized authoritarian bureaucracy is uh, not a good thing. And uh, we knew that, I mean, the Soviet Union was a centralized bureaucracy. It didn't work very well. <laughs> exactly. And yes. uh, I think that, Where did that uh, a centralized bureaucracy is not going to work in other settings either. So. No, I agree. The other thing, so, so what I find fascinating about that example is that arguably you have politicians climbing on board these kinds of centralized treaties. So they don't have to worry then that there'll be some kind of differentiated response to an issue and then that would in turn embarrass them so yeah. they want to hop onto these treaties so it somehow prevents them from being embarrassed for their response i mean this is how corrupt it becomes who's serving whom are the politicians serving themselves and their reputation or are they serving the people this is the kind of other lesson that comes out of this is it not i think so and I have sympathy for the politicians in the spring of 2020 that they did Indeed, not necessarily yeah. know what to do because they were not exper experts on epidemiology. But mm -hmm. what I don't have sympathy for is one is if you are a politician, you should you should listen to a diverge of views. Uh, yes. And then uh, for for a few years, this pandemic was the major political issue. So mm -hmm. it's the responsibility of the politicians to actually read up on it and try to learn something mm -hmm. about infectious diseases and epidemiology. And exactly. not just say, well, okay, I'm going to do like everybody else does. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And and it reminds me of the importance that of how do you make decisions. Um, I think of conversations with our friend and, and colleague, Dr. William Happer, who's obviously a legend in terms of uh, scientific research, but he would be a big advocate, uh, certainly in his work in, um, in defense of using red blue exercises, setting up debates. Imagine that Martin debates of different perspectives so that you say, well, man, we can actually learn from each other. Yeah. No, there should have been many of these discussions and they didn't happen. There were very few happened. Yeah. So it's, it's really remarkable. And I think another example then coming out of this um, COVID-19 that is really retrospective and very, very uh, timely has been the whole debate about the origins of COVID-19 vis-a-vis what is it called again? Oh yes, the People's Republic of China and the Wuhan lab. Because you recall that there was all kinds of references that somehow this came out of some kind of, oh, what was it? Some kind of bat soup or something like this and, and that uh, somehow it was naturally occurring. I mean, this line was maintained again and again and again. And from the beginning, it, it came uh, out fairly quickly that, well, it was likely from this unique one of a kind level four lab in China called the Wuhan lab. So does that all surprise you in retrospect that that we have all kinds of receipts and documentation report after report confirming that it came from that Wuhan lab? Uh, no, I mean, lab leaks can happen. And I don't think that uh, if uh, I'm very skeptical of doing this gain of function research. So, mm. but what's also very concerning, I think, is that uh, obviously in early 2020, we didn't know. So it could have been uh, 
from a lab leak. It could have been from a market. It could have been some other naturally occurring mm. things. So we didn't know. But the DBA was shut down. Anybody who uh, wanted to explore where they could have been from the lab was sort of shut down, and uh, uh, that was not allowed. And there was some conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Yes, so we to me, conspiracy that, theorists. To me, that's very worrying that you can't even discuss these things. So something is decided, mm -hmm. and if you want to explore uh, so with an open sci mind scientifically, then you're being called yeah. a conspiracy theorist and you're being cancelled and slandered. And exactly. to me, that's uh, you can't you can't make progress with uh, science that way. And people who scientists who engage in that activities, they should uh, they should not be scientists. Maybe they should. I agree. Be, maybe they should be politicians because that's what they do. Politicians do, but I think politicians Indeed. don't do that either. So. <laughs> Indeed. So speaking of politicians then, and this is all, I think, very related, uh, Martin, um, is uh, this uh, week in Canada, we had a really quite a bomb dropped in terms of the whole issue of our level four lab, our national lab based in Winnipeg, where there was a revelation that there was significant leaking going on there. So let, we'll get to that clip. This is from government documents, the Trudeau government's own documents. It says, here on page 142, Winnipeg lab scientist Dr. Chu is head of the special pathogens unit, the top person in that job. According to documents on page 242, quote, represents a serious and credible danger to the government of Canada as a whole, and in particular at facilities considered high security due to the potential for theft of dangerous materials attractive to terrorists and foreign entities that conduct espionage to infiltrate and damage the economic security of Canada, end quote. It states further on page 239, investigators assess that Dr. Chu communicated with foreign entities during her trips to China. The evidence obtained from interviews and from information collected from the electronic content of her devices reveal that this is indeed the case. As a subject matter expert with access to sensitive information and dangerous materials, Dr. Chu presents a realistic and credible threat to Canada's economic security when conducting repeated and clandestine meetings with foreign entities, end quote. Then it says Dr. Chu conducted joint research with the Major General Chen Wei of the People's Liberation Army, who according to page 236, is a noted top virologist at the Academy of Military Medical Scientists and is China's chief Biologic, biological defense expert engaged in research related to biosafety, biodefense, and bioterrorism. So that's a stunning revelation because for years now, our federal government has refused to reveal uh, the information that there was a relationship, a particular relationship between the head of a Canadian lab this national lab based in Winnipeg, uh, the director of, of special pathogens, as I recall, and the head of bioterrorism of the People's Liberation Army in China. So perhaps one of the lessons we've learned as well, Martin, is the, um, the vulnerability of influence and relationships between our own nations and the work that was going on, obviously, in the Wuhan lab, we know that you referenced the research funding that was from the United States and other intermediaries for gain of function research. Maybe you could explain to us what gain of function research is really all about. Well, they, uh, again, this is not my area of expertise because it's virology, but they manipulate mm -hmm. the viruses so that they will be more uh, enhance their capabilities to, for example, to be infected from one person to another. So, uh, uh, and presumably they do it because they do that so that they they, they, they can uh, find ways to uh, to uh, prevent uh, or develop vaccines, for example, or to study how they behave. But if there's a lab leak, that can have uh, enormous consequences, of course. So uh, one should not take this type of research very lightly. And 
I'm not surprised that many governments uh, are involved in this because uh, the military parts of it. But I think mm -hmm. that uh, as scientists, I think we should try to stay out of it. Exactly. So we, we certainly uh, have learned a lot about, you know, in reflection with you about the dangers of censorship, the, the need for open debate, particularly when we do science. And I think actually uh, George Bernard Shaw said the first condition of progress is the removal of censorship. So I wanted to share with you this clip that relates to you, uh, Dr. Martin Kulderf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Twitter fires files were not just about Hunter Biden's laptop. Twitter files make it apparent Twitter worked overtime to suppress accurate COVID information. Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine at Stanford who once tweeted an article he wrote about natural immunity. Thanks to Elon Musk's release of the Twitter files, we learned some of his tweets were tagged with the label of trends blacklist. Apparently, the views of a Stanford doctor are disinformation to you people. I, along with many Americans, have long-term effects from COVID. Not only was I a long hauler, but I have effects from the vaccine. It wasn't the first shot, but it was the second shot that I now developed asthma that has never gone away since I had the second shot. Um, I have tremors in my left hand, and I have the occasional heart pain that no doctor can explain, and I've had a battery of tests. I find it extremely alarming Twitter's unfettered censorship spread into medical fields and affected millions of Americans by suppressing expert opinions from doctors and censoring those who disagree with the CDC. I have great regrets about getting the shot because of the health issues that I now have that I don't think are ever going to go away. And I know that I'm not the only American who has those kinds of concerns. Another example of what Twitter has done to censor Folks, is uh, from Dr. Martin Koldorf, a Harvard-educated epidemiologist, who once tweeted, COVID vaccines are important for high-risk people and their caretakers. Those with prior natural infection do not need it, nor children. The Twitter files reveal this tweet was deemed false information because it ran contrary to the CDC. So my first question this morning of Ms. Gaddy, may I ask of you, where did you go to medical school? I did not go to medical school. I'm sorry? I did not go to medical school. That's what I thought. Why do you think you or anyone else at Twitter had the medical expertise to censor a doctor's expert opinion? Our policies regarding COVID were designed to protect individuals. We were seeing- You guys censored Harvard-educated doctors, Stanford-educated doctors, doctors that are educated in the best places in the world, and you silenced those voices. My next question is, did the U.S. government, oh, excuse me, I have another chart I want to show you, Ms. Gaddy. Um, I have another tweet by someone with a following of a full 18,000 followers. This person put a chart from the CDC on Twitter. It's the CDC's own data, so it's accurate by your standards. And you all labeled this as misleading. You're not a doctor, right, Ms. Gaddy? No, I'm not. Okay, what makes you think you or anyone else of Twitter have the medical expertise to censor actual, accurate CDC data? I'm not familiar with these particular situations. Yeah, I'm sure you're not, but this is what Twitter did. They labeled this as inaccurate. It is the government's own data. It's ridiculous that we're even having to have this conversation today. It's not just about the laptop. This is about medical advice that expert doctors were trying to give Americans because social media companies like Twitter were silencing their voices. I have another question, my last one for you, Ms. Ty uh, Ms. Gaddy. Did the U.S. government ever contact you or anyone at Twitter to pressure Twitter to moderate or censor certain tweets? Yes or no? We have a program. Did the U.S. government ever contact you or anyone at Twitter to censor or moderate certain tweets? Yes or no? We receive legal demands to remove content from the platform from the U.S. government and governments all around the world. Those are published on a third-party website, and anyone can review Thank them. God for Matt Taibbi. Thank God for Elon Musk for allowing to show us in the world that Twitter was basically a subsidiary 
of the FBI, censoring real medical voices with real expertise that put real Americans' lives in danger because they didn't have that information. I also want to thank one of my colleagues, uh, Ro Khanna, because it, as it turns out, censorship isn't just an important issue to conservatives. Some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, like Ro, uh, found this censorship very concerning um, and even wrote to you and to folks at Twitter um, that uh, he was concerned about the First Amendment being censored. So I want to thank him for speaking up and speaking out about this issue um, because this is not, this should not be a, a partisan issue. This should be an issue that's an American issue. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into uh, the record, I ask unanimous consent, to enter into the record a Wall Street Journal article from December 9th, 2022 by Justin Hart entitled The Twitter back Blacklisting of Jay Bhattacharya. And to the record, please, Mr. Chairman. With that objection, so ordered. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, there you have it. It's quite a powerful clip. And, and what's fascinating is a couple things, one of which is that uh, Congresswoman uh, Nancy Mace uh, eloquently goes through that background and information. And that was about a year ago. And what's interesting is behind her is a um, uh, a listing of, of, um, of responses from Dr. Martin Calder. So... When they were talking about people censored, that included Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, of course, our friend, but you, Dr. Martin Koldor. So how do you how do you look at that looking back uh, from about a year ago now? Well, I was censored multiple times by Twitter, by LinkedIn, YouTube, which is owned by uh, Google. Uh, LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft and also by Facebook. So uh, hmm. if you had told me five years ago, uh, that I would, as a scientist, be censored for uh, saying uh, uh, scientific truths, uh, I would have uh, laughed at you and thought you were not mm. a conspiracy theorist. Exactly. I could never have imagined this would happen, and I think it's shocking. And it's very bad for, not just for the pandemic, I think it's bad for society as a whole, for, for other things. And Indeed. I would also say that when the First Amendment was, uh, uh, when the U.S. got its First Amendment of, of uh, freedom of speech, that was uh, after a, a very turbulent time, a crisis, because it was during the War of Independence, uh, after the War of Independence. Yeah. So yeah. those who wrote that, they, I think they realized that it is, it's especially when you have a crisis. Mm -hmm. that freedom of speech is important. Uh, so it was especially important to value freedom of speech during the pandemic. That's when it's most important to safeguard it. So this idea that we can have it when everything is fine, but when there's a problem, we have to take it down. Well, I guess that's an opinion for uh, uh, authoritarian politician who doesn't want their uh, thoughts to be questioned. Uh, well, so. but, who, but who doesn't have the capacity to argue. So if somebody doesn't have, if, if somebody can argue for their stance, they will do so and they can do so. But if they mm -hmm. can't, they will have to either use silencing and censoring or they have to use slander uh, and canceling. Those are the only two things that are available to them. Well said. No, I, I, I think you make a very powerful point that freedom of speech matters. It's critical to have healthy debate in a society uh, uh just you know uh, well said so in this the context only, the only thing that i would uh, disagree with representative nancy mace is that i think she has uh, far too high uh, opinion about harvard and stanford okay <laughs> indeed that's the only thing yeah, i disagree so this with is, her on. yeah so that that is the irony is that we also have institutions and i think post the uh, october 7 terrorist attacks by hamas on israel we saw the testimony from the heads of those institutions come forward and gosh, yeah, to what extent they have freedom of speech is, is really a good question. Um, so that testimony, though, it's very also interesting. It was a year ago and we've learned a lot since then because, uh, you know, it's like being in a room and you only see part of the elephant. And now we're seeing a bigger picture. And that is the, the revelations that just came out about a month ago, confirming that there have been some 67 
U.S. agencies also linked to the Five Eyes um, intelligence agreement, including the United States, New Zealand, Australia, United States, of course, and Canada. So the level of censorship here matters, and that in the particular example of the United States, there were 67 agencies systematically directing those social media companies. Because I think for a number of years, we thought, well, is Twitter just, you know, really biased and systematically um, uh, censoring any kind of comment? Well, no, it was actually much worse than that. You had agencies from the government behind the scenes clearly directing them under penalty of law that they would lose their license. So they had to comply in order to survive. So I think that is a totally new revelation. And so not to be outdone, we have a situation in this country in Canada where this week our federal government introduced online censorship bills, legal legislation that will, if passed, um, censor all kinds of things on our internet. It's a full frontal attack on freedom of speech. There will be penalties, both financially for social media companies, does this sound familiar, but also jail time, including life sentences to people that are deemed to be infracting this kind of law. This is very, very disturbing. And so how do we do science Dr. Calderf, how do we do science, open discussion, and search for the truth if everywhere you turn you think that someone could sue you and legally attack you and put you in jail if you can't seek the truth? We don't. We can't. Uh, it's concerning for science, but I think it's, it's also concerned for the whole society. Uh, and uh, in the United States, we have a lawsuit. It's called uh, Missouri versus Biden, where I am uh, uh, one of the plaintiffs. Yes. So with the attorney generals of uh, Missouri and Louisiana, together with myself, uh, Dr. Jebar Lashaya, Aaron Kriati, uh, Jill Hines, and Jim Hoft, uh, we have sued uh, the federal government so it's Biden and his official capacity as president, but also another yes. many other named agency like CDC, FBI, uh, and so on. And we are we are basically saying that you have to stop pressuring social media companies to do uh, the kind of censoring that uh, you have been engaged in. And we uh, uh, we we uh, we received a temporary injunction against the government in the federal court in the uh, district court in Louisiana. And then I think it was in August last year that uh, the federal, mm. the, the federal uh, government appealed it. So in, I think it was around August that uh, we won again in the Fifth Circuit Course of mm. Appeal. And now it's uh, they, they appeal that to the Supreme Court. So that, that's now being heard in the Supreme Court. And we have the oral arguments on March 18. So uh, just uh, two, three weeks from now. And I think it's uh, the most important First Amendment free speech case uh in the in the u.s uh, in many many uh, in a long long time indeed so bravo on you uh to you martin and other other colleagues like uh, dr j Bhattacharya, and of course the attorney general of missouri uh for taking on that case uh regarding the first amendment for freedom of speech speech so you're on the front line of this moving this agenda forward because you were vilified attacked um it was it was just really pathetic how you were persecuted for speaking really basic truths and opinions regarding health that mattered in people's lives so it is it's and it's, really it's a, important to realize also that uh, this lawsuit is not only because the federal government did something to me and those others who were censored is actually yeah, even but, more important the citizens of Missouri and the citizens of Louisiana, they were deprived yes. from hearing things about the pandemic that they have a right to hear. Exactly. So when somebody mm -hmm. is censored, it's not always the person who's being censored that's the major victim. The major victim is the people who can't hear what they want to hear, what they need to hear. 
Right. And so in the Canadian context, we've actually had physician groups, dare I say cutouts, basically kind of proxies for different governments that would actually, they actually threatened or undertook legal action against others who said, no, this is not uh, correct in terms of, of the management of COVID-19. So they were threatened and even attacked by those groups. So now in Canada, if you introduce that kind of online censorship um, bill, you basically give them a weapon to go after anyone else who disagrees with them. That's my take on it, uh, as well as the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, among so many others. So this is this is a very important time in the life of our country, let alone Western countries, including the United States, uh, for for really what you refer to as uh, the Enlightenment. I know you've spoken eloquently about protecting that, but that's the context in which we face now, is it not, Martin? Yes, if we don't have freedom of speech, the age of enlightenment is over. And uh, we had it for a few hundred years, uh, but that would be it. So I think we have to fight to try to to keep it. Uh, to, uh, there's no more important fight than to fight for freedom of speech, I think. Really is. Because every well, other fight depends on that. As we kind of wind up our, our uh, discussion, we've certainly uh, had a very far reaching discussion. There are some green shoots of hope. There's signs of renewal. Uh, you certainly mentioned the um, the uh, First Amendment speech that's going uh, case that's going to the Supreme Court of the United States that you're involved with. Um, in Canada, we we've had a number of cases now where um, there are physicians who were once uh, ticketed or under under threat of losing their license by um, the College of Physicians that are now having those decisions overturned. I think of Dr. Uh, Colvinder um, Gill, who's a pediatric um, allergist in Toronto, who yeah, was very condemned brave, a brave, very during brave COVID-19. Physician, very brave physicians who spoke up during the pandemic. Uh, enormous admiration for her. So I, I, I think, uh, what are other signs that, uh, of hope that you're seeing, uh, Martin, as you see people uh, become more aware of these issues and speak up? I think the biggest positive sign is in the population at large, who are more and more people understanding it, more and more people are understanding that uh, what a disaster the pandemic response was. Uh, more and more people are, are concerned about uh, uh, our democracy and uh, freedom of speech. And that's the only thing they're going to change it because the rulers are not going to change things voluntarily. They uh, they prefer to to do it to sort of, you know, they, they feel threatened. And it's when they feel threatened that they institute this censorship uh, regime. If they weren't threatened, they wouldn't need that. So uh, the fact that they're doing it is actually a sign that they feel threatened. And I'm glad they are threatened and we have to continue to make them feel uncomfortable and make sure that uh, we can keep freedom of speech and that we can keep uh, society and our civilization. Well said, Dr. Martin Koldorf. And I wanna thank you for all your leadership and your courage and for having this far reaching discussion today with us. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And thank you for uh, all the work you're doing. Uh, it's so important. Thank you. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.